I think the basis of the story we're trying to tell is that it's a con karmic confluence of persons. Persons who, for whatever reason, through the expression and execution of various forms of modern art, found themselves karmically intertwined with one another. I took Urban Nightmare very seriously, but in some ways not seriously enough. I don't think I realized the power of this entity that we'd created in the sense that it had an identity separate from the sum of its parts, greater than the sum of its parts, if you will. Of course, the story we're telling begins with the fateful meeting in 1989 between Brent, Dean Crabb, and myself. But really, it has karmic ties that dig much deeper into our pasts. For me, I've traced it as far back as junior high school, or even, even farther if you think about it. But that's not important here. Basically, I had been in a lot of different bands prior to joining Urban Nightmare. and with various degrees of creative satisfaction. But Urban Nightmare was different. As far as the way I viewed it, Urban Nightmare was the result of a very specific statement of intent. Very specific. Something that called into play forces beyond the norm, beyond normal perception. And I had a very specific idea for what I wanted Urban Nightmare to be. Uh, the idea that we forbade vocals, we didn't want vocals, is not a hundred percent accurate. It's just that from where we were approaching the music, it didn't have a place yet. I had uh, been a student of many radical forms of 20th century art, such as Dadaism, Mertz, Cubism, Surrealism, and uh, the group that uh, Yoko Ono was part of, Flux. And those movements in art inspired me to want to do a kind of music that was obviously influenced by other modern forms, such as rock and roll, but was not rock and roll. It was something that would reflect the benefits of modern technology of as if to say here's where we've been here's everywhere we've been now here's where we can go we know all of these things we've, we've done all of these things we've, we've approached them as just defining them as flavors in and of themselves now here we can put them in a big matrix and interchange them at will because we are modernists and that in essence was the purpose and scope of polymodernism it was the idea that we were not limited by any one musical scale or set of musical scales or family of musical scales that they were all equally available to us to use as compositional frameworks it was the idea that we were not limited to a particular rhythmic pattern. It was the idea that we could combine multiple rhythmic patterns within one piece. Oh sure, 
key and de you know tempo changes and key changes and all those things are not unique to music that came before but here the whole purpose was to incorporate that artistic license to a new level a new level of fluidity a new level of interchangeability and interoperability and it was hard to keep that faith to keep that vision it's a challenge it's too easy to slip back into old ways neuron paths in the brain get get formed when you learn to play a musical instrument and they're hard to break these hard these patterns these channels are hard to break i knew that it would take a lot of very deliberate intensely focused study a lot of discipline and a lot of willingness to bear the slings and arrows of fellow musicians and fellow rock and rollers who wouldn't get it at first, who wouldn't, who would see it in its immature stages and not understand it, and make a mockery of it, and certainly that happened. But there were times when we had a finished product, and I played it for people whose musical tastes uh, barely ventured beyond Sammy Hagar, for example. And they liked it. Everybody who I ever played our tapes for seemed to think it was pretty good stuff. Some people thought of it as progressive rock. Well, yes, I suppose. I mean, it was progressive and it certainly had the instrumentation of rock. But I always saw it as something different. 